Okay. Um, thank you for joining uh, everyone. Uh, we are continuing our uh, uh, Bible study in the book of uh, Ephesians. And today we'll be in chapter 3. And uh, we will be looking at verse 1 to verse 13. Uh, before we begin, uh, perhaps we can uh, say a word of prayer. If I can request uh, Ben to say a prayer, please. Okay, let us pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you, Lord, for this evening. We come before you, Master, to uh, really learn, oh God, what your word has to speak to us, Lord. Give us um, open ears, open minds, Master, to, to understand what depth your words have for us, oh God, and help us to not just be hearers, but to also be doers of your word, word oh God. So, Please, Holy Spirit, we ask you right now to help us understand everything that is about to be taught. Please be with uh, Ashwin as well as he teaches us everything that we need to know. We love you, we praise you, and we ask all this in your most precious name. Amen. Amen. Um, so we'll begin with verse 1 in chapter 3. So that's where we left off uh, last time. So verse 1, chapter 3. Um, Paul says, when I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles. Now, I just want to pause there and I thought uh, I should point you to something very unique in that verse. Now, if you notice, I've highlighted something in this verse. Okay. I've highlighted the three dots that are, uh, you know, that are given after the word Gentiles. That's how it is there in my NLT Bible. Those three dots are not something which I entered. It is part of the Bible, you know, verse in, in the uh, NLT translation. Now, in some of your translations, like if you have an NIV translation, you won't see dots, but you will see a double dash. You'll see a couple of dashes, or, you know, a long dash after the word Gentiles. I think in KJV, you won't see any, any such marking, any such uh, symbols. But the reason why I want to highlight this is because this has a, you know, this has a reason behind it. And uh, the reason is Paul is being interrupted uh, by, by himself. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, as Paul is beginning to make a point in verse 1, he suddenly has an, you know, he suddenly realizes that he needs to say something else before making this point. You know, just like how when, when somebody is uh, you know, speaking or sharing in a meeting or having a conversation with somebody, you've heard people begin a sentence and then suddenly say, oh, oh, by the way, you know, let me tell you this first. And then they go back to the point they were originally trying to make. That's what's happening here uh, with Paul. He's beginning to make a point, but then he pauses, he, he takes a step back, he says, wait a minute, I have something else to say before I, I finish this point. And if you notice verse 14, all the way, go all the way down to verse 14. He says, when I think of all this, that's how he begins verse 14. What Paul is doing is he is resuming the thought he began in verse 1. But what happened between verse 1 and verse 14? You know, Paul digressed. In verse 2, he, he says, oh, by the way. And then he goes off to talk about something else. It's like he, he shifts topic. And then only in verse 14, after you know, 12 verses, he, he, he goes back to the original point And he says the same thing, same phrase, when I think of all this. So what happened in between? Okay? Why did Paul digress after verse 1? The reason is because of this word, prisoner in verse 1. That's why he, he digressed. You know, when Paul is writing this epistle, you know, he's not, he not in his retired house, lying down you know, in a hammock, enjoying a glass of drink and writing an epistle uh, you know, to the Ephesians. Paul is not in his, you know, in a, in a comfortable space. Paul is actually a prisoner at the time when he was writing this episode, even though he calls himself a prisoner of Christ, he was, in reality, uh, he was being imprisoned by the Roman government. Um, in fact, Paul was being chained 
to a Roman soldier. He was being chained to a Roman guard. And, and the reason why Paul digresses is because as he writes the word prisoner, he realizes that the Ephesians, uh, the, the church, will have some questions. The church will have some doubts. Because I, the, the question is, is this what you get from Jesus? I mean, Paul has done such great work. He is spreading the gospel. He is telling people about Jesus. But is this what ultimately happens to somebody who is doing a good work? And so the people, you know, in the Ephesians church, they, they have doubts. They have questions. And, uh, and, and some of them are probably even discouraged. Some of them are, are, they are disheartened to the fact that Paul, Paul is, you know, uh, being chained to a Roman soldier. He's taken as a prisoner. Now, when you and I read this, we don't, we don't feel so much for Paul because Paul is somebody who is, who is distant to us. We read his epistles, but Paul is not somebody whom we personally know, like somebody in our, in our church. But for the people in Ephesians, Paul was, was personally known to them. They knew Paul. They, you know, Paul brought the message to them and, and they had a personal relationship with Paul. So Paul could sense that the people would be disheartened and people would be discouraged. Uh, at the thought of Paul being imprisoned, when all he did was just spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. It can even instill doubts and fears and all kinds of questions. And Paul wants to address that before he makes the point which he was beginning to make in verse 1. And we know this because in verse 13, that I'm showing you on the screen, in verse 13, Paul says, I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. See, the reason why Paul digressed was because he wanted to take a moment and, and share a few things so that the people in the church are not discouraged or you know, disheartened because of Paul's sufferings. Now, it's interesting that he was chained to a, to a Roman soldier. right? And I think without a doubt, we can, we can know that Paul would have preached the gospel to the soldier who was, who was chained to him. right? I think he would have probably considering the fact that he was you know, chained as a prisoner, I think he would have brought up the verse in Romans, where Paul talks about being a slave to sin and being a slave to righteousness. You know, I, I think Paul would have said, everybody is a prisoner. Everybody is a slave, is a prisoner to their sin. And everybody can either be, can, can, can only either be a prisoner to sin or be a prisoner to Jesus. And I think Paul would have pointed out to this Roman soldier that even though physically I'm chained as a prisoner to you, in reality, I'm a prisoner of Christ. That's how Paul call, uh, calls himself. He calls himself a prisoner of Christ. In verse 1, he says, you know, when I think of all this, I call a prisoner of Christ. That's how he calls himself. Because the reality is only prisoners of Christ, so to speak, are truly free. You know, there are many people who are in prison, many people who are walking free, but true freedom comes from, you know, being a prisoner of, of Christ. Now, you know, in, uh, in the Bible, many times the word servant is used to describe a Christian, in the uh, New Testament especially. But, you know, uh, in, the, in the original language, the word doesn't mean servant, it actually means slave when it describes the Christian. And the reason why the people were so afraid to translate that word as slave was because we obviously know what slave generally means, you know, in our, in our society. You know, the, the moment we think about the word slavery, all we can think about is human cruelty. You know, we read some cruel stories about, you know, slaves who were beaten, who were, who were tormented, tortured to death. And so slavery brings that kind of an image and a picture to our, uh, to our minds. But nevertheless, the word the Bible uses is the word slave and not servants when it describes Christians in, in many places. Now, in some translations like the NLT, which was more recent, uh, in some places, they accurately translated as slave and, and, and not as uh, a servants. But there is a difference between a slave and a servant. The consequence of not translating it as slave is, is that it's lost its meaning. You see, a servant, he gets to work in his, in his or her master's house, and a servant gets paid for the labor. But a slave doesn't get paid for the labor they do. A servant gets to go back home after they finish the work in the master's house. 
whereas a servant doesn't get sorry a slave doesn't get to do that you know a servant gets a you know a, a wage a monthly salary or a weekly salary but a slave never gets paid for the work they do in fact the master spends a lot of money to purchase the slave so the master owns the slave uh, you know for all the work that he that he wants to do now that's that's the picture you know that that's the meaning of of being a slave you know in the biblical times now of course it has its you know demerits but it was not necessarily a uh, you know a bad thing considering the kind of society they were living in because a slave could find you know security uh, protection um, you know uh, provision and uh, you know all kinds of things you need for your survival in his master's house even though he is you know owned by the master he could find all all sorts of you know such benefits in his master's house so so it was not, it was not necessarily a bad thing um, considering the kind of society they were living in now the reason why this is uh, this is important is because uh, the bible specifically addresses you know describes christian as as a slave uh, you know to to jesus but you know jesus gave a name change what he said was in john chapter 15 verse 15 he says i no longer call you servants uh, or to be more accurate slaves i don't call you slaves anymore because uh, a slave or a servant does not know the master's business i have instead called you friends because everything i've learned from my father i have made known to you so jesus is saying that i'm not going to call you slaves and i'm calling you friends now the problem is you know some people have taken this verse and you know have have completely done away with the fact that jesus is still our lord and if he's still our lord it means we are still to be as a slave to jesus which means he owns us he owns everything that we we have he has complete leadership uh, you know complete ownership of, over our lives that's what it means to be a slave and and, and people have taken this verse you know where jesus says you not you're not a slave anymore you're just a friend people have taken that verse and you know come up with all kinds of different uh, you know teachings and doctrines right one of the teachings which you know is you know name it and claim it right if you see a car just name it and then claim it if you see a big house name it and claim it part of you know this prosperity uh, gospel and theology what they have actually done is they've made themselves lord and they have made uh, an imaginary jesus as their uh, slave you know as their butler somebody who just brings things whenever you know they ask for whenever they claim it but what jesus is saying is you, jesus is still lord over our lives but he's giving an, an an added benefit to that relationship jesus still has a master slave relationship with us but he's giving an added benefit and that is he gives us insight he tells us secrets about the father's business you see a slave when he works you know in the master's house he doesn't get to know what his master is actually doing he doesn't get to know the details about the master's work his affairs his business his job whatever he is into he is kept at a distance and he's just supposed to carry out his duties but jesus is saying no no i'm not looking for that kind of a relationship i am lord i will have ownership but but we're going to do it as partners at the same time you will know the details of my father's business you will know the the the, the secrets of my of my father's business and paul is being an exact reflection of this fact paul was a you know paul you know he considers himself as a prisoner of christ but he's also a friend of god you know why because in this passage paul is about to reveal some secrets that god kept hidden for ages and 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 for, and for generations and paul is reflecting the fact that he's not just a prisoner but he's also he's also a friend who knows you know insights and secrets that god has specifically revealed uh, to to paul now before we look at you know what are the things what are the secrets that god revealed uh, to paul i want to point out the fact that paul maintains such a such a unique attitude in this in this trial in this time because not once you see paul complaining about his his trials uh, you know in this in this passage uh, let me read verse 7 verse 8 paul says in, in in verse 7 by god's grace and mighty power i have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news 
And then in verse 8, he says, Though I'm the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. You know, Paul is repeating a word, if you notice, and that's the word privilege. The reason why Paul doesn't complain, the reason why Paul doesn't have this, this gloomy attitude, but rather the opposite, is because of that word privilege that he repeats. Because according to Paul, Serving God remains a privilege despite the suffering. Despite the cost, serving God is still a privilege. And Paul doesn't lose sight of the fact that no matter what it costs and what, what suffering he has to go through, it's a privilege. And, and it's like this, you know, all of us, we, we serve God in, in some capacity, in, in some way. But do we see serving God as a privilege despite you know, what it costs us, despite the inconveniences, despite the size or the, uh, or, or the significance of our service. You know, for, I think for many people, it, it takes a lot. You know, perhaps it takes a big stage and a big ministry and a big, uh, you know, a big crowd for them to feel, finally feel like, wow, what a privilege to serve God. Such a, such a huge uh, opportunity. But, but, the, but the attitude that, you know, that Paul had and the attitude which God wants us to have is that we see service to God as a privilege, no matter what size, you know, the, you know, of our ministry is, no matter what it costs, no matter what the suffering, but we see it as a privilege uh, from beginning till the end. So that's the, that's the unique attitude that, that you see Paul maintaining. And what's, you know, ironic is the fact that as Paul is, is you know, suffering in this trial, he's the one who is encouraging, who's trying to encourage the people in the church of Ephesians. It's not the other way around. And it's a reflection of what Jesus did when, when he was about to go to the cross before he went. When he was the one who needed the comfort and the encouragement, he spent time with his disciples, comforting others and uh, encouraging others. How was Paul able to do that? We will, you know, we'll, uh, we'll get into that. But, but Paul makes this claim that God has revealed a big secret. There's a big secret that God has revealed, right? The God, you know, God's best kept secret. Uh, if you read verse 9 in, in chapter 3, Paul says, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. And uh, and of course, he tells us what the secret is. It's no longer a secret. And it's about the question, who are God's people? You know, if you read verse 5 and 6, Paul says, God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. In verse 6, he says, and this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. It's about the question, who are God's people? Because for generations and for ages, you know, if you read the Old Testament, you see, you know, you see that only Jews were the chosen people. Only Jews were, were God's people. And Paul is saying, but I came with a new message a unique message because of which I'm in chains, because of which I'm, I'm suffering. But it's a, it's a message worth sharing because it is God's secret that he has personally revealed to me. And Paul sees that as a special responsibility of sharing this message. And that message is that God's people are not only Jews, as it was seen before, but God's people are all believers, whether Jews or Gentiles, but all believers uh, in Jesus. All those who have repented and believe in Jesus, they are God's people. And, and this message was, was unheard of, especially the Jews were furious when, when Paul uh, you know, brought this, this message. But God was, you know, he, he, he uh, progressively revealed the fact that God is, God is not about a flag. He's not about one particular nation. God's heart is for all the nations. You know, the Bible says he he wants all men. He desires all men to people, all people to repent and, and turn to him. And it doesn't matter which uh, you know which flag you're you know you 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 salute to which flag you're uh, 
you know, your, your nation uh, posts. Uh, it's, it's about the fact that you believe in Jesus. And it doesn't matter where you are and who you are and uh, what you've done in the past. But anybody who repents and comes to Jesus, you know, and uh, trusts in Jesus gets to be part of God's people. And that's the message that Paul was bringing. And that's the message that Paul brought to the Gentiles because they needed, you know, they needed to hear this. But it cost Paul uh, so much of, you know, uh, suffering. And the, the ultimate truth is that God welcomes all people. God welcomes everyone. I remember reading the story of um, Corrie ten Boom. And uh, she, I think it's in the book of, a book called Tramp to the Lord, where she speaks about, you know, her uh, experiences that she had after she came out of the, you know, the, the German concentration camp. And she says that, you know, uh, she was one day sharing a, uh, a sermon about forgiveness, the beauty of God's forgiveness and how we are also to forgive others. And then she says, after she finished the sermon, there was a man who came forward and, and, uh, and, and he stretched his you know, hand forward uh, you know, for, a, for a handshake. And then she realized that this man who had you know, come to greet her and talk to her, the same man who was there in the concentration camp as a soldier who tortured uh, you know, many people and even tortured herself and her sister who ended up dying uh, in, that, in that camp. And when she, when she saw this man, she couldn't apply the, the message that she just preached about forgiveness. But in that moment, it felt, you know, God showed her that, that God wants even that man to repent and come to him. And so she says, you know, she beautifully shares that in that moment, it was like God, God put his love in my heart. And that made me capable of giving a handshake back to him and, and, and truly, you know, show love and, and not be unforgiving towards him. God miraculously put his love in my heart, which I was able to extend to him. And, and, and that story tells us that God wants everyone. God welcomes everyone, even the people in, in your life who've hurt you, who have, you know, who have said things, who've done things that, that still bother you, that still, you know, disturb you in, in your spirit. The truth is, no matter what they've done, God wants even that person to come to him. God is inviting even that person to come to Jesus. You know, when I was working with, uh, with World Bank, I had a, you know, uh, a, a conflict with, with one of my senior colleagues and uh, I had a very, very difficult time, a hard time. And, and I struggled with, you know, with, uh, with, with unforgiveness, with bitterness in my heart. But when I was praying, God showed me that in spite of all that's happening, in spite of all that this person has done, God wants, God welcomes even that person into his kingdom. God invites even that person uh, into his, his kingdom. And, 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 I, and I felt like God was showing me that that's how we should see everybody. Even the people who have hurt you, that's the way to see them. The way God uh, sees them. Because God welcomes everyone and he wants all men everywhere to, to repent and come to him. And Paul says, you know, this, this has been a, uh, you know, this is a mystery because he says, both the Jews and, and the Gentiles, you know, both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings. Both have the equal share. There's no favoritism between, you know, the Jews and the uh, Gentiles. Now, when he says one, you know, they're part of the same body, what he's talking about is the universal church, right? The, in every church, inside every church, there is a church. Somebody said that, you know, very brilliantly. Because not Every local church member is part of the universal church. And when I say universal church, I'm talking about true believers who belong to different churches, different uh, denominations in different parts of the world, in different countries. All of them together make the true universal church, the true body of Jesus. But not every local church, not, not every person in, in our local church or in any, any local church is necessarily part of the universal church. And also at the same time, every member of the universal church, you know, the, the entire body of Christ, the true body of Christ, is ideally part of a local church. Because, you know, there are people who say, yes, I believe Jesus, I, I follow Jesus, but I don't have to go to church. Church is not really, you know, necessary. I can read my Bible at home and I can pray. Uh, I don't need to hear, you know, sermons and worship, you know, with other people. 
Now there are times when when that's not possible even for a for a true believer, maybe because of the circumstance, you know, where he is and the work he's doing, uh, like a missionary or something. But every member of the universal church is, uh, you know, is ideally part of a local church. And when Paul says, you know, uh, the same body, you know, whether Jews or Gentiles, they're part of the same body, he's talking about the uh, universal church. But that doesn't mean that you, you neglect uh, being part of a local church because Paul here is writing this letter to a local church. So, um, so that's the secret and, and the mystery that uh, Paul, is, Paul is revealing. And he gives a very interesting detail in this passage. And that is what happened to the you know, fallen angels as they have come to see all this, as they have come to see that because of God's you know, uh, great plan, because of the cross of Jesus, that now you know, Jews and the Gentiles, they've all become part of one body. What, what is their reaction? And in verse 10, um, Paul says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom, God's wisdom, in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You know, it's like Paul is saying, these fallen angels, it's like they got schooled by God's wisdom. It's like they've been taught a lesson by God's wisdom. You know, it's like in the Old Testament, if you see all they were bothered about, you know, the target was just the Jews, right? Just, just Jews who were known as the God's people. But now because of Jesus, what they're seeing is random people are coming into God's kingdom. You know, people from different countries, different, uh, you know, nationalities, all kinds of people are now <laughs> entering God's kingdom. And it's not just Jews, it's, it's Gentiles. And, you know, as, as, as one scholar put it, God was educating the fallen angels uh, about his wisdom, which is, you know, it's a manifold wisdom. There are many aspects to his wisdom which are, which are mind-blowing. And, and, and the fallen angels, which, by the way, when Paul says unseen rulers and authorities, uh, you know, it is, it is uh, commonly known that he's, he's referring to the fallen angels and not, not necessarily the, the good ones. And so he says they, they stand in awe, they are stunned and they are schooled at the fact that God's eternal plan, God's plan always was to save everybody. And it's like the story of Joseph, uh, right? He was, you know, there was so much of evil that happened in his life. His, uh, his brothers sold him into slavery. But then in the end, you know, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It was, it was a display of God's wisdom in that, uh, in that story. And, and so Paul mentions that, that detail that, uh, you know, he was chosen to, to share this, this marvelous secret, this marvelous message to the Gentiles. Now, Christianity is both inclusive and exclusive. It's inclusive because Jesus invites everyone. But it's also exclusive because not everyone invites Jesus into their lives. Uh, if you read verse 12, he says, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. I want you to notice the phrase, our faith in him. Christianity is not just inclusive. Of course, God wants everybody to come to him, but it's also exclusive because not everybody invites Jesus or rather accepts his invitation. It is only those who come to faith in Jesus. They get to become a part of God's body and become a believer. So that, that's the unique paradox of Christianity. It's both inclusive and, uh, and exclusive. There is a doctrine which, you know, I think somebody uh, promoted perhaps many years ago called universal salvation, which means that in the end, ultimately, everybody is going to go to heaven because the cross is going to be applied to all people, not just those who come to faith, you know, come to you know, repent and trust in Jesus, but, but to all people. But that is a denial of the truth that uh, Christianity is exclusive. It's not just everybody is welcome, 
but it's those who repent and trust in Jesus. And that's, that's made clear uh, in that verse. And then finally, what's interesting is that even though Paul, you know, as a prisoner, you know, he is in trial and he is, um, you know, he's suffering. As I said before, he, you know, he took the effort to comfort the church to which he is writing. And in the, that's what you see in verse uh, 13. Paul says, don't, please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I'm suffering for you, so you should feel uh, honored. Now, how is it that, you know, even though Paul is the one who's suffering, who's in trial, how is it that he was able to comfort uh, those in the church, even though he's the one who is, who is suffering? You know, there's something very interesting the Bible tells us in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and that is, when God comforts us, we can comfort others. Paul says in, in, in 2 Corinthians that God comforts us so that we can comfort others. I think Paul found his comfort in God. Because he says in the previous verse that because of Jesus, we can boldly enter God's presence. I think that's where Paul found his comfort, in God's presence. And because Paul found comfort in God, in spite of his suffering and in spite of his trials, he was able to comfort others. And that's how the uh, story ends. Now, now this, this whole study, which I wanted to share, is just this, this digression and, and, uh, and, and these interesting things that you learn uh, about Paul and from Paul's life and attitude before he moves on to you know, verse 14. And in verse 14, as I said, that's where he, he resumes his original thought in verse 1. Because uh, yeah, in, in verse 14, he says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And then he goes on to pray for the people in church to experience intimacy with God. So in verse 1, when he says, when I think of all this, I fall, what he was going to do was he was going to pray. He was going to talk about how he prays, uh, you know, how he prayed for the, for the church, which, which would be very interesting considering the fact that, you know, he was chained uh, you know, to this Roman soldier, because he says, I bowed my knees, you know, I, I bow my knees and, and I pray uh, for you. But Paul digressed because he wanted to encourage, because he knew that the moment he mentions that he's a prisoner and he's suffering, he knew that the Ephesians, the people there would, would have questions and doubts. And he wants to clarify, look at the bigger picture. Don't look at the, the temporary trials and sufferings of my life. But I just showed you the bigger picture. I just showed you God's eternal plan, God's glorious wisdom. I just showed you all that so that you can fix your eyes on the things above, not on the things that are happening, not on the temporary uh, trials that are, you know, that we are going through. And by that, Paul was hoping that they would be, uh, you know, encouraged and not disheartened at Paul's uh, trials. So, uh, so that's that's uh, that's what I wanted to. Uh, share from the study. I'll just do a quick recap of, of some of the you know, things we learned from this, uh, this short passage. Okay, things to remember as we close. Only prisoners of Christ are truly free because freedom is not doing whatever you want, but it's doing what God wants. It is being in the will of God and carrying out God's will. That's why Paul, uh, you know, as he called himself a prisoner of Christ, he had complete freedom. He was set free on the inside. Because he was all about uh, God's will. So only prisoners of Christ are truly free. And serving God remains a privilege despite the suffering, despite the size, the significance of, of, your, of your service. You have to see it as a privilege uh, that God's given you. And God welcomes everyone, even your enemies, even those whom you've hurt. God wants you to pray uh, even for, for those people. And when God comforts us, we can comfort others. So those were the uh, lessons I believe we can take from this passage that, uh, that we just uh, looked at. So in the next uh, um, Bible study, which, which will be the week after next, we will be studying from uh, chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 14. So uh, I just I just pray uh, I just hope that at least one of these points you know spoke to you I I, I hope that uh, 
uh, that you could relate to these points, that you can take this to your heart and you can pray about you know, these, these points as, as we study. Because ultimately, the reason why we want to study the Bible and you know, going, go in depth is not because we can gain an you know, understanding, you know, intellectual understanding, but, but to grow in our intimacy with, uh, you know, with, with Jesus. So whatever God has spoken to you among these points, ask yourself, whichever point it was, pray about that point and, and, uh, and, and ask God for help to apply that in your life. Thank you so much for uh, joining. Uh, we will just close with, uh, with a prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for this time again, for this, uh, for this meeting, Lord, for your word. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, that you have, you have blessed us so richly, Lord. Lord, not just, Lord, in terms of provision and, and uh, Lord, in, in, our, in our physical life, but you've showed us, Lord, through your word that you've blessed us spiritually, Lord. You've given us spiritual blessings. Lord, help us to, help us to see the privilege that we have, Lord, in our lives. The fact that you've given us life, the fact that, Lord, we have salvation, which many people, Lord, you know, have not come to experience. Lord, the, the, the privilege of getting to talk to you, prayer, the privilege of having a relationship with you and intimacy with you. Lord, we thank you for all these, all these privileges that you've given to us. And Lord, help us to, Lord, uh, keep our eyes fixed on the bigger picture, Lord. Not just have a, have a uh, narrow, Lord, you know, sight uh, on, our, on our lives, Lord, such a small view, but, but help us to see the bigger picture which you've revealed in, in your word. Lord, help us to get caught up, Lord, in the, in the, in the, in the eternal plan that you've revealed uh, to us. I pray, Lord, that you will, uh, you will bless each one of us, Lord, whatever, Lord, we learn from this study. I pray that we will apply that, you know, to our hearts and we will live it out with your help. Uh, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.